All right, so we are on the cloud. Um, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Anne-Lee Steele. I'm the community manager for the Turing Way, and I'll be kicking off this session to tell you a little bit more about our project before, before passing the mic on to Malvika Sharon, um, my colleague and co-lead of the Turing Way, to take it away for the second fireside chat of 2023. A little bit about the Turing Way is an open source, open collaboration and community developed handbook um, on data science. Our goal is to make reproducible, ethical and collaborative data science possible and to make it both accessible and comprehensible for everyone. And while I'm kicking off the session today, I'm part of a wider team that includes Malvika and many others, many of which are here um, and represent a wider and international community of researchers who have created and maintained the shared resource. They themselves bring perspectives from their fields, their countries, their backgrounds, their lived experiences. Um, and this Fireside Chat series has really been an effort towards creating a shared space across open science communities, and indeed across the wider open ecosystem, where people can gather and exchange concerns, challenges, questions, and explore and share different practices that work in their context to build allyship, to understand each other's work and perspectives just a little bit better. And with this being said, I'm really excited um, to uh, introduce this month's topic, Implementing Open Science at Scale, with a series of really excellent um, speakers. And a couple of housekeeping things um, before we get started. One, please note uh, that we have a shared etherpad um, to facilitate written note taking and invite others um, to share your ideas um, you, from you who have joined in. Feel free to add your questions and notes um, either in the pad or here in the chat and we'll make sure to post them um, in either a place for posterity. And we also have a code of conduct that applies to this event to ensure accessibility and respectful collaboration. And for any concerns, reporting of an incident that makes you feel uncomfortable at this call, or further ideas on how we can improve our own practices and accessibility and otherwise, please email the Turingway at gmail.com. And you can also directly reach out to myself or to Malvika by emailing us at our Turing emails, which we have on the Etherpad, um, and which is all available there. Uh, just another reminder is that we will be hosting um, and holding the Zoom room open for an additional 15 minutes after the um, one hour and 15 minutes of our scheduled call for an unrecorded open discussion. And this is completely optional for you to um, stick around, but it is where we turn off the recordings and kind of ask questions of each other and of ourselves in perhaps a less formal space um, than the already informal space that we aim to create with the fireside chat. Um, and it usually ends up being a very interesting conversation. So we invite you to stick around for that. But with that, I'm really delighted to hand over the mic to Malvika uh, to kick off today's session. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, welcome everyone. This is such a privilege to be in this space. I am Malvika Sharan. As Anne said, I'm a senior researcher at the Alan Turing Institute and a co-lead for the Turing Way. My focus areas are open research and community building. I lead a team of community managers who provide specialized expertise across different projects at the Institute. Um, and our role is to accelerate adoption of reproducible, ethical, collaborative practices at the Institute, but overall uh, through the Turing Way. One of those implementation include open science. How does that look like in different projects, but also uh, in the context of open science? I've been involved in a lot of open science initiative and it has been several years now and I operate with the principle and respect for situated knowledge and contextualized approaches to understand that open science looks very different in different perspective in the global south, global north, in different domain areas that we work on. So it is my huge privilege today to be able to be a co-facilitator along with Dr. Shell Gentleman, who I would invite to introduce herself and her project. Thank you so much, Malvika. I'm really honored to be here. Thanks everyone for joining, especially at least for me, it's quite early in the morning in California. And I hope you're having a good Friday evening in Europe and wherever else you might be. So I am Dr. Shell Genteman. I am the science lead for NASA's Transform to Open Science mission, which is a five year, $40 million mission to really accelerate the adoption of open science broaden participation in science, especially among historically excluded groups, 
and enable breakthrough discoveries based in open science practices. This project was just kicked off uh, about a year ago. This is our first big year. Uh, and we've joined the US White House in having 2023, a year of open science, to really try and again, accelerate this adoption and start activities to move more towards open science. We really recognize that we need open science. These breakthroughs will help us thrive. And also closed science, the hoarding of information and resources and the silos of knowledge that are, that are created not only do they hold science back, but they limit who can participate and they act as a barrier for participation in science, especially by those who haven't been traditionally included. So we're really looking to move the dial on this and I'm really excited to be here working with the Turian Way and supporting open science globally. Thank you so much, Shell. Um, with that, I'll start uh, spotlighting our other speakers for today and um yeah thank you so much and am i missing folks can you ask them there you go we're all we're all here on the stage um and i would like to now move to the introduction of our other speakers uh, asking them to position themselves and their organization's work in implementing open science i'll start with Knox. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Noxula Mkono. I'm the Deputy Director of the African Open Science Platform. It's good to be here and to be joined by everybody. So basically for us, we are trying to make sure everybody in the continent pulls together and doesn't get left behind, but more importantly, to understand what open science means for the, for the continent. Thank you. Thank you, Nox. Welcome. Yes, hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, um, everyone. Also, a, a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, my name is Anna Persic. I work for UNESCO, which is the United Nations Agency for Science, Culture, and uh, Communication and Education. And um, I work for um, the division of the section of science, technology, innovation policies, and in particular on open science. And in UNESCO, um, in November last year, we, the, our, our member states, 193 countries, basically adopted uh, the first international legal standard setting instrument on open science, which is the UNESCO recommendation on open science. So that recommendation is really a way of providing an international framework on open science with some shared values and shared principles and some shared pathway and the idea of where we should all collectively be going with open science. So um, I have had the pleasure to coordinate the development of this recommendation and I'm now involved in the facilitation of its implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Steve. Hi, I'm Steve Crawford. I am the lead for the Open Source Science uh, Initiative and uh, also the Science Data Officer for Policy uh, in the Science Mission Directorate. I'm part of the Chief Science Data Office. Um, and uh, my background has been as a, an astronomer uh, working in open science. You forgot to say NASA. <laughs> and at NASA, yes, at the Science Mission Directorate of NASA. Thank you for that nudge. Uh, Thank you so much, Steve. Alex. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure being here today. Thank you for inviting me. I, I'm speaking from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I am the uh, preprint coordinator at Cielo Brazil. And we are, we at Cielo, we, we are a collection of journals. We have over 300 journals and we are on a mission uh, since a few years now to migrate all of our journals from open access to full open uh, science. Uh, we've been doing that for a few years, as I said, and I, I, I had a privilege to co-lead this, this uh, mission. Um, and uh, in Brazil, we are doing that. We are moving forward. And Cielo is also um, present in other countries. Uh, in total, we uh, the Cielo network is composed by uh, 16 countries. 
Uh, so we are also doing some work in these other countries to, to establish and to implement uh, open science uh, practices. So I'm very looking forward to the discussions today. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you once again, everyone, for being here. Uh, for others' awareness, Knox is having some internet issues today, uh, so she will come in and out. Um, but we hope that she can join us for most of our discussion. All right, so with that, I'm going to pass it to Shell to kick us off today. Thanks, Malvika. So we wanted to start off talking about open access and its impact on open science. And so, Alex, we wanted to start off with you and sort of think about, you know, it's not an understatement that open access initiatives are among some of the earliest movers and shakers of open science. Only over the last decade have we really expanded our understanding of open science beyond just the result, the open access publication. However, it stays central to many of the conversations around open science policy, advocacy, and financial investments. What challenges do you face in influencing the broader implementation of open science when stakeholders still understand open science is just open access publications? So we'll begin with Alex. and. Can you share your insights as a representative of SILO that is celebrating 25 years provided open access infrastructure in Brazil and neighboring countries? Thank you for the question, uh, Chell. Um, yes, um, it's very interesting because we are, we've been open access since the beginning. Um, so for us, it's never been a question about uh, uh, whether or not to, to be open access. Uh, but for the transition for open science has proven to be way more challenging because it involves other actors, uh, other players in the, in the process. You now have the, the reviewers, you have the authors uh, as well that, that need to be uh, uh, fully involved in the process. Uh, so that, that adds complexity, 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 complexity to the to this, uh, this process. Uh, the first time we we talked about open science to our journals was uh, at our, our our annual meeting in twenty seventeen, uh, which is uh, six was six years ago, and then the following year on the occasion of our twentieth anniversary, we also uh, established some priority lines of action to, to migrate our journals to open science practices. And we've been working with that since then. Uh, so five years later, we made some progress. That's true, but we, we still, we, we're not where we thought we would be or, or, or we wanted to be. There's, a, there's still a lot of resistance um, in many aspects. Uh, from journals in terms of uh, uh, doing open, open peer review, for example, from authors to fully understand what open science best practices are. Uh, there's also some, uh, I would say, uh, some, some conflict with uh, research agencies' policies, which are not fully aligned to open science practices. So all of that, uh, have been um, have, have proven to be challenges, um, and also uh, in terms of we are a collection of of journals. We host journals from several areas of knowledge, so not just one area. And we also notice that uh, there are particularities from area to area. So there are things that make sense for some areas of knowledge, and there are other things that don't make sense or uh, are, should be adapted or different for, for the, the specific area. Uh, so we are also navigating those differences and those uh, asymmetries, as we like to call, not only in the, from the, the areas of knowledge, but looking at the countries. Uh, as I said before, we, we have a, a network and, and the countries have uh, different 
policies and different uh, cultures, different publishing cultures, publishing um, stages, or, or, or uh, it's not symmetrical. So uh, we need to navigate those differences as well. And uh, those are proving to be very challenging uh, in terms of area, as I said, in countries. Uh, and to mitigate that, we are uh, conducting forums and spaces and meetings uh, uh, in our journals, with our journals and, and with the other countries that are part of the CLO network to discuss what our, uh, what strategies should be applied and what makes sense for you as a journal, uh, as a country. Uh, so those are some of the things that we've been, we've been doing for the past few years. And uh, those are some of the biggest challenges that, that we are facing. It's, it's interesting because that's been, I think some of our experience too, is just the nuances of each community and each micro community within it. and navigating that when just trying to advance openness. Uh, Knox, are you back? I think you're back online. Did you catch the question or do you want me to repeat it? Uh, you're muted. Yeah, no, I, I, I got the question. Um, okay. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a, I think it's a, it's a difficult, it's an easy and a difficult one, as Mavrika had said, that the open access movement was kind of like the first one that came through, but I don't think where we are is how it was envisaged when it, it started. And this is my fear with how we starting with open science, if it's not um, looked after properly, it may uh, evolve into something else we did not envision. But I, I think, uh, open access model, which sometimes I prefer not to call it because it confuses us with the current APC model. So the, 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 the open access science communication that is envisioned and, and I think uh, people in CELO are, are, are doing is important. And for the global South is even more important to make sure that the access and inclusivity and equity to, 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 to knowledge is important. But of course, as I said, the, the initial movement was removing the barrier to access, but we have created a different wall of pain. So if we can try to figure out how now to remove that wall, and of course, then everybody will have actually you know, equitable access to the knowledge that, that is available. So we, we need to try and figure out uh, what this means. But I think the important thing is that we need to think about how not to discuss um, open access as in scholarly public publishing, because this is what takes up the most time, but as in open access of knowledge in a wider view, not just for scholarly publication, because that actually takes up a lot of open science con uh, conversation, which actually then takes away for other important things. Thank you. And I think that that aligns with, there's a comment in the chat that is important point about policies and research assessment is that there shouldn't be a tax on researchers that adopt open practices, which can happen if the only measure for evaluation is journal publications. And that goes towards your point of broadening what are the incentives for research and what do we consider, you know, meritus, what are the best practices in open science? Steve, did you have comments on this? I mean, I, I, the, the previous two com comments were, were great. And uh, I actually fully agree with both of them. Um, you know, I think uh, the U.S. has, you know, uh, with the recent release of the OSTP memo on ensuring free, immediate, and equitable access to federally funded research, um, has set that aspect and expectation that U.S. Uh, funded research uh, will be made available with no embargo period. Um, as Kai mentioned, like what that means in terms of shifts in things like article page charges, um, how preprints are used, um, and and uh, what that means for for different um, you know uh, communities and and access to scientific information. And I, I I should mention is that like in there is both publications and data, um, and talking about actually making uh, both of those. Uh, equally accessible. 
Um, but that is one of the things that we do actually really have to think about uh, as we work toward implementing this is those unexpected impacts and those impacts on the communities uh, who don't have the resources of NASA um, as we actually shift this uh, kind of discussion. And in, in, you know, we know the importance of, of making information uh, immediately open and accessible. Uh, for those who are, are it's most important to, they can have immediate access to it, but we can't, uh, we, we can't shut out people from that publication uh, process of uh, at the same time. And so we will need to be working toward finding that right balance. Thank you. Uh, Anna, did you have comments? Yes, I mean, I think um, in, in our case, um, the UNESCO recommendation really has a very broad definition of what open science is. So yes, we're talking about open access to scientific knowledge, which looks into open access to publications, to data, to source code, hardware, software, but we're also talking about open infrastructures. We're also talking about engagement with other societal actors through citizen science or other participatory voluntary science. And we're also talking about dialogue with other knowledge systems, meaning indigenous knowledge system, traditional knowledge system, marginalized, science, marginalized scholars, etc. So really, it is a very broad view of how science should be opened. And I think the biggest challenge is that to get there, there is really a cultural shift in the scientific system that has to change and that has to happen. And that can be done through a lot of awareness raising and capacity building, making everybody in the system understand what, what uh, we are talking about. And then through incentives, as it was mentioned before um, as well, because for the moment, the incentives in the scientific world are not necessarily aligned with all these ideas of what open science should be and how it should work. Um, I think another very important challenge is that indeed, when you open up this space of openness of science, you really do have to work with all kinds of different communities, not only across disciplines, not only across nations, but beyond the traditional scientific communities, right? So you really have to have scientists talking to publishers, to editors, to policymakers, to uh, communities. So it's a whole innovators. Um, it Again, it's a whole different kind of way of doing science and conceiving what the value of science is, collaborations become much more important than competition, for example, in this, in this space. The science is seen as a process, not as a product, as what we have uh, in the end. The value is really of what science brings to everybody, not just to a small community who can, which can understand what um, a specific research result is. So it really is a, it's a big cultural change, but it really is what science should be um, going forward for sure. Yeah, and I think, I think Anna, you really, you touched on something that we hear a lot of, which is about the competition and, uh, especially for early career researchers in such an incredibly competitive environment for science. The, the fear that being open will somehow decrease your competitivity instead of building these networks and these collaborations that expand your impact and your, but that it's sometimes it's, it's, it takes time to explain and it takes trust both in the community that you're going to get credit. So it's, it's, a nuanced problem. Uh, and I think now we're going to move on. Does anybody have any little, little closing comments or we'll move on to another topic with Malvika? Yeah, I think I just want to add something. I think what both of you, Cheryl and Anna, are talking about, about competition in, in, in with the emerging researchers, I, I, I think uh, what UNESCO has nuanced is science as a public good, not as a an individual will take that away. But then of course we're dealing with human or certain needs that we need them just to incentivize that as we had pointed out, Cheryl, that people can move and have that shift. And I think 
that is actually the biggest needle we can move is incentivization because then we're asking this human to do all those things, but without uh, specifying what are the rewards. And I think that's also why it's so important to have funding agencies, institutions, and policymakers here because the competition is played by a set of rules. And so what makes you competitive can shift in the new world. Malvika? Yeah, um, I think uh, some of the topics that came up, and especially, Anna, you mentioned Open Science recommendation from UNESCO that has been serving, I'm going to use Knox word, a departure point for a lot of different countries to build their own understanding. Um, but not just, right? You, UNESCO serves as a convening capacity builder in the space for bringing together actors from different contexts, from different parts of the world with different priorities. How have the resources and, and initiative you in the UNESCO have co-created helps build that shared vocabulary and understanding for open science and its implementation? Can you share some of your um, experiences and impact you have seen? Thank you very much for this question and for these kind words about, uh, uh, about the role of UNESCO. Um, I think in this space of open science, uh, what was really important is to have this long consultative inclusive process to come up with the text of the recommendation. So, and it was something that was requested by our member states. They did want a process to come up with a text of recommendation where everybody would feel reflected and where there would be a lot of people who would feel ownership of the text that come out of it. So basically for two years, we have had, I don't know how many consultations in all kinds of different forms uh, and venues. Uh, and in a way, the fact that it was basically during COVID times was not that bad in the sense that there was a lot of emphasis on sharing of information. And I think a lot of people understood better what open science might mean. And then by kind of moving online, we actually managed to reach out to a much wider audience than we would have if we had had the usual consultations that happen in, in you know, different continents in different areas where you gather a certain amount of people, but never huge amounts like we had. Like for example, our consultation for Latin America, I think we had some 5,000 people who were present, uh, who added their comments in the chat, who uh, participated, etc., and who now are part of a community that is trying to um, implement the recommendation um, as well. So I think really what, what was extremely important is to listen to all of the different voices, to try to understand where the differences are, where the synergies are. Different regions really have different challenges also and we try to reflect that and I think this is something that is still guiding us in the implementation of the recommendation because the recommendation gives a framework values and principles but it's very obvious that the way you will implement it will really depend on where you stand whether the different disciplines as uh, Alex was saying different knowledge sources have very different um um, uh, ways of, of practicing uh, open science. Uh, capacities are different, infrastructures are different, all of that needs to be taken into account. But I think what is really important and what we are trying to push as much as possible is that for open science to succeed, it really has to happen equitably across the world. So there I think there will there is going to be a lot of talks also in the future about north south 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 triangular collaborations and if we can again put more value into those collaborations and really value them while we are doing them I think that is also something that is going to be a great uh, achievement of open science if, if it really happens the way it, um, the way it should and we are hoping that from the UNESCO side, we will also be able to facilitate some of these collaborations um, and the way to ensure equity in open science. Because there is risk, of course. Uh, uh, open science very much depends on infrastructures, uh, internet connectivity, 
uh, technologies, and we know that they are not equally distributed across the world. Even within different countries, there, there is uh, difficulties in access by certain communities. So this needs to be kind of taken into consideration anytime you do any open science type of practice, particularly at the larger, at the larger scale. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'm going to actually ask Shell because uh, I have also seen you doing this convening work a lot within the NASA team to bring international communities, although, of course, NASA exists in the US. Can you share your perspective uh, building on some of the points that Anna made? Yeah, I think that we're learning so much as uh, an agency, as an organization, as a project, as we're working to advance open science, both within NASA and then because science is global internationally. So we've been doing a lot of outreach, uh, both externally and internally within NASA. And one of the first principles, one of the first things we recognized and was that all of the existing resources. There are open science Jupiter books, there are free resources, there's things like the Turing Way, which is one of the first things that I found when I was trying to figure out what open science was and how to how to move in that direction. And those resources are so valuable to all of the global scientific community. So one of the things that our project is working on is sort of building on those and creating a open science curriculum that has uh, this international flavor, this international voice, starting with talking to a lot of NASA experts, but also a global international team that created uh, Open Sciency, this whole book on how to do open science. So. These, these resources and this co-development, I think is so powerful because I've found that they're challenging me to expand what I think about science and what I think about collaborations. And they're challenging me to think about approaching things in different ways. And it's just, it's been so valuable. Uh, I, I can't thank everyone enough who's contributed to the project in any way because it's it's just uh, it's it's made me believe in science again, you know. <laughs> it's going to be a tough question that I'm going to ask, but I would ask you to think about the top one. There are lots of challenges that Anna was saying that when you convene these different people with different priorities, yeah. Um, what has been the top challenge, um, and if at all you have address them or you're in the process of addressing them, what, what does that look like? I think for us, one of the biggest challenges has been valuing, recognizing and ensuring that we value uh, different approaches. And what I mean by that is I, without realizing that each of our communities has a very uh, uh, a certain way of speaking to each other, a certain expectation as to how you introduce ideas, of how you interact in a group, how you ask questions and create space for answers. And we found that that is really different depending on what group you're talking to and that that can create conflict. And so navigating that and really trying to center our interactions around kindness, I think, has been challenging. I think many people go in with very good intentions, but simply different modes of communication can often create uh, friction. Yeah, I I, I agree with Shell. It's it, it it's not always easy. And I th I think what we have also seen is that still people don't necessarily understand what open means. So you have a lot of pushback because people will say, oh, open is completely free. Open means that you cannot have a patent. Open means this, open means that. Like assuming a lot of things of what open science is, which is not, oh, if we, do, if we talk to traditional communities, that's not going to be science anymore. This is not how we do it. So it's really, 
and, and you, you sometimes get that quite aggressive response. And then when you start talking and, and making people understand what you actually mean, and that open does not mean that you throw everything you're doing online without any protections, without any consideration for security, for anything else, for intellectual property rights, etc., that you have to balance what you can get in terms of economic benefits from science and what you, what you can get um, from non taking uh, economic benefits from so there is a lot it, it's very it's it's nuanced but i think it's very important that all of us explain well what open science is and what it is not and then we're going to get m many more people on board because they will start understanding what exactly we are talking about yes that's that's a great sorry. point i'm uh, sorry uh, great point raised by anna and uh, yes uh, uh, people think that everything should be open, and it's it's not exactly like that. There's we understand that there, there are some things that should not be open because they should be restricted. There are some legal issues, or it, it could be a uh, privacy uh, issue uh, happening. So, but some openness is better than no openness at all. So, uh, and and finding that balance, balance and communicating that balance to all the stakeholders is very challenging. Yeah, yeah, I was I was about to just also jump on 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 Anna's point. Just also, if we distill that 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 aggressive reaction, and actually, what I've seen is fear and mistrust or lack of trust, it's, it just comes to those things. So if we can try to address these two things on the question of open science, which is of course uh, incentivization and, and what open is open, it, I think we will go a long way. Then it comes to that dialogue and explanation and awareness to engage with all the stakeholders, what does this mean? And I, I, I had to have a little bit of a, a chuckle at Anna's comment because there's so many times I've, I've had that conversation and, and kind of actually explained open science and what it includes and the different practices. And then the person who's been totally resistant to open science just goes, oh, I've been doing a bunch of those. That's just good science. And, and, and you're like, yep. And yeah, that, that those practices that make science more reproducible, uh, more inclusive, more accessible, you know, are parts of the, the the aspects of just, you know, how you communicate science and how you share science. And and it is so many things which people are are already doing. That brings us really nicely to the next part of mobilizing local communities. And I'll pass to Shell. Yeah, I agree. What a nice segue. Thank you. Uh, so now we wanted to move from recommendations to talking about action. Uh, my tea is kicking in, the caffeine, so let's get going. Uh, so what have been the five years reflections from leading on the African Open Science Platform and enabling like the technical infrastructure, practices and policy and supporting open science regionally? So what incentives, research assessments and measures have been crucial for mobilizing communities through the African Open Science Platform's work and impacting the implementation approaches. So Knox, we would really hope that you would talk about this mobilization of local scientific communities. Yeah, I, I hope I can cover much. So I, I think the African Open Science or AOSP as we fondly call it, was a bit, bit fortunate or had some inside knowledge because one of the drivers or the first founders of open science was, I think, uh, uh, chair of, of one of these uh, consultative committees with UNESCO. So he was trying to position Africa to make sure that when the recommendation come, we are kind of sort of ready. So it, it, it we started started as a, as a brainchild in about 2015, we, a, a different consultation in, in, in Africa happened, Egypt and the North, and until, of course, it was kind of launched between 2017 and 2018. So we've been in the office where we were trying to make sure that we kind of set up the, the, the structure of how it would work. And then we are in a process of now having the actual nodes. 
But in parallel, what we've been trying, we've been trying to have a lot of community consultation. I think one of our biggest successful one is one we had with UNESCO at the World Science Forum last year. And inclusive of that is that because the World Science Forum was held in South Africa and the host was the Department of Science and Technology. So we made sure that we input into the program that throughout this theme of openness and, and social justice is carried out through. And it, I, th I think it went quite well. So we had a lot of then from there, a lot of awareness on, on our stakeholders, both in Africa and in the world, I'm talking about open science, but in the same time, also throughout about two years, we've been talking to a lot of stakeholders, which are basically we pinpoint as the national uh, uh, education and research networks that we work with to try and try to engage the stakeholders and what they, they, they understand about open science in Africa. And I, I, I think, we are at a stage where we are distilling what is important and what we think we need to prioritize because I, I, I think, and I've uh, spoken to Anna about this, is that it is such a broad thing. It is such a, a big thing that sometimes you get overwhelmed where to start. So, but you have to start. And that, that's what I say, we just have to, to do something. So I think we, will, we are now starting to work on a few activities where we are trying to, get everybody together, which is mostly for now geared on towards on, on data platforms that are held within Africa, because we know there's a lot of knowledge that is happening in Africa, but most of the data is outside of Africa. This also speaks to the consent of the researchers and scientists that are involved in, in open sharing ways. So we try to, to balance that out with our partners. And then I think we are trying to do a lot of uh, project on open access and repositories to make sure that we also align the type of, of, of thinking. What we've started working on, and I think Africa will play one of the largest role is other knowledge systems. So this is a little bit of, of, of difficulty because I cannot speak to those knowledge system. You need the holders of knowledge systems and their processes of engaging to come through. So we are trying to identify those holders of knowledge system, and then they can tell us how they would like this process to work. Because unlike the traditional systems, it's easier, you just have a discussion and decide they have a different way of, of, of talking. But I think the diversity of knowledge systems, and I think in Asia and South America will be the same, would be, will play a very important role in, in inputting what frameworks and, and what are the communities of practices or processes that we could take into engaging with other knowledge systems. So we are really trying to push in, in, this, in this angle. And, and I hope I have represented AOSP very well because my boss is here. I won't say who. <laughs> Thank you, Knox. Alex, did you have any comments about this? Yeah. Um... We are here at Cielo, uh, we are just, everything we do, there's some uh, open science aspect to it, or uh, is, is, we, are, we always ask ourselves, uh, how does this help us uh, in, in being more uh, aligned to open science practices? So everything we do is, is really uh, around that. So we, we, we do uh, small things uh, from uh, surveying our journals, uh, asking them about making specific questions about open science practices, just to have a feeling of what their perception is. And uh, it also, we believe that when we survey people, we are also uh, making them think about the, the topic. It's not something that they reflect when they answer the question. So it is also part of our, our strategy to raise awareness for open science practices. Uh, just last year, uh, the, the, the group that composed the humanities area uh, of journals that are part of our collection, uh, they held a, a meeting, an online meeting, specifically to discuss uh, open science practices. And we provided the, uh, the environment, the, the infrastructure, uh, we organized uh, everything for them. So we provided the space 
for them to and the infrastructure for them to do that. And it was very, very, uh, very great uh, discussions uh, that was held because it was uh, discipline oriented. It was uh, very much uh, centered on their, their needs and their challenges. So it was very great. Uh, we also are always uh, mindful of providing resources, uh, blog posts. Uh, uh, so we have a blog and we are also, we are always uh, writing about open science uh, so that we keep the conversation and, and, and the dialogue uh, going because it's something that it's constantly changing and we need to uh, to be, stay informed about the changes. Um, so I think it's important to offer this space for dialogue to really listen. We're very worried about listening um, the many disciplines and the countries that we are also um, that are part of our network because there are differences it's not it's it's it doesn't it's not have it's not supposed to be top down it has to be there's some, there's there should be a dialogue for that and more recently we are doing a series of seminars um uh, for that will lead up to the the big conference that we are having on September in September, celebrating our twenty fifth anniversary. And those seminars they are uh, mostly focused on open science. And we the, the great thing about the seminars is that we are partnering with um, uh, institutions and other countries from our collection to make them uh, to ask them to 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 uh, provide and, and to do the seminars uh, and to hear from them. Uh, so it's not just us, uh, Cielo speaking. We, we re really want to uh, have uh, different voices and, and, and provide uh, 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 different perspectives to this dialogue. So we're having the seminars that, we, that have been running since March and they will run until July, covering all different uh, topics from open science and also the EIA policies and best practices. Uh, and these are some, um, the discussions are kind of a warm up for what we will discuss during the conference, which will also um, be like a milestone for us because they will, at the conference, we will define our priorities for the following five years. And, and that will, uh, we will keep advancing in, in, in migrating our journals towards open science. I had a quick follow-up question for Alex and Knox. I know that when you're working with these local communities and trying to get a ground swell of support, in the US, 15% of our, almost 15% of our population uh, speaks Spanish is their first language. So it's very important, like I think that how much of that do you like that? Because that's a, it's a lot of effort to translate these into different languages, but it's part of being welcoming and meeting people where they are. Has that been really important when you're doing local outreach? Yeah, I, I think Shelly, you're correct. So what we've been trying to do on our um, meetings that, or, 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 or dialogues that we have, we try to have all the translation and the major translations in in in. in in Africa, we do French and Portuguese, but these are not major. But I think as the platform, what we had, what we envisage is that we're gonna have five regional nodes. We already kind of finished selecting three. That's going to be North Africa. So it will translate and work with the Arabic kind of speaking region. And then we're gonna have a node in West Africa, which is mostly French, and then move from that and maybe take up other la uh, 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 language and then of course, you have Central, which is more Anglophone, and then the Southern region. So this is how we think we, we envisage, and this also will speak to regional needs instead of, of the of the Secretariat, which is in South Africa, speaking to it, because especially in Africa, it's so diverse. So we think the nodes will be kind of like their face of the of the of the open science movement in, in their region, and this will take care of all the differences that, that are within the region and their needs. Yes, uh, multilingualism is key for us. Uh, we, um, uh, we we work mainly with three languages: Portuguese, Spanish, and and, and English. 
Um, so everything that we do, or almost everything, as much as we can, we are always uh, providing translations. Uh, we see that as a, a dimension of inclusiveness. Uh, so we, we are always uh, very aware of, of, of uh, multilingualism. In fact, uh, it was a key um, factor when we were looking for a, a platform to have our uh, preprint server. Uh, we ended up chose, choosing uh, OPS, Open Preprints uh, Systems from uh, PKP, because among other reasons, uh, because they they provided, it was a platform that would allow us to, to be uh, multilingual. So that is, uh, that is uh, oftentimes it is uh, something that uh, ends up being, uh, uh, has a, having a big, uh, portion of the decision making process in CLO, we are always looking for uh, ways to uh, that would allow us to be uh, to offer translations and, and multilingualism. I mean, it's not always easy and it's also um, uh, uh, it gives us some extra work, but it's uh, it's something that it's it's been key for us and uh, it would always Great, thank you. Yeah, one of my first uh, uh, Python mentors was from Brazil and was doing notebooks in English and Portuguese. And it was just, it just, it's just a way of welcoming and being, like it was just such a natural extension, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's also quite in South Africa, maybe, I don't know you guys are familiar, we have 11 official languages, so it, you have to be kind of like multilingual in a way just for us. But if you can then understand the diversity in Africa, they may not be official, but it's, 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 it's a lot of languages. So we we are looking to working with repositories. Some of them are starting to do translation in Swahili and other bigger language groups. And then of course, you will just go a little bit more and more additional. Great, I think Malvika, uh, it's 6.55. I wanted to just do a time check with you. Um, yeah, we are we are good. I, we have one bigger discussion left and I would say we have 17 minutes. If we can leave the five minutes for closing, we have enough for that bigger chunk discussion. Okay, so should I keep moving on? Okay, so our next topic is enabling institutional change. So Steve, you're up. Uh, Steve is immersed in the institution uh, and making incredible progress. Uh, so building on these insights from sort of talking about local communities and some of the discussion earlier about, you know, changing the rules. Uh, changing the game so that we really ensure uh, open science becomes institutionalized. So we'd like to hear, Steve, about some of your work at NASA. Uh, NASA has been releasing open data for decades and has been working to shift the discussion on open science. So what it has happened over the years institutionally in terms of policies, recommendations and infrastructure, you know, before TOPS, and the NASA TOPS mission, and what has been really successful, and what have been some of the challenges? Yeah, no, I, you know, one of the great things, uh, especially about NASA, is that um, openness is actually, you know, it's it's in our founding document in the the Space Act law, which uh, created NASA. One of the one of the goals of the overall agency is openly sharing our our discoveries with the world. Um, and we've had a long history of, of sharing our data, um, you know, with Earth data being made publicly available in the, the 80s and uh, the Hubble Space Telescope data being shared since its launch uh, in, in the 90s. Um, you know, and uh, so this long history of, of openness. At the same time, there's a lot of, of policies and regulations and processes uh, for how that information and, and different aspects get shared. Um, around uh, the the uh, around 2013, OSTP, the Office of Science, Technology, and Policy, uh, had released a memo about uh, sharing federal federal scientific research. Uh, NASA released uh, and put together their plan for for sharing scientific research. 
But the science mission directorate took it even one step further to actually say, what can we actually be doing more to actually share the information that we're producing? And this was uh, led by uh, Kevin Murphy and, and Alan Gertzen uh, to put together a working group to really look at this. And, you know, one of the things that was really, that made this possible was uh, the, the the leadership of the uh, leader of SMD at the time, Thomas Serbukin, really supporting the activities. So that's one aspect is having um, these multiple different, uh, you know, support from leadership is, is definitely th something that makes uh, institutional change uh, possible. Um, but the other aspect was, you know, the, the, the NASA community has long been leaders in that area of, of open science uh, uh, and, and open uh, research in terms of data accessibility, uh, things like the archive of astronomy groups making their publications openly available, uh, standards and, and working closely with a lot of different groups about how you make information and, and uh, openly available and, and also open source. Um, the, the, you know, the software, uh, I mean, uh, Margaret Hamilton's Apollo software is open source and, and has been, you know, for decades. Uh, but at the same time, there's lots of groups who were uh, always uh, within NASA and, and uh, 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 outside of NASA in the astronomy and earth science fields making their software open source. And so, uh, but at the same time, NASA had a lot of, uh, and, and has a lot of bureaucracy and policies and red tape around how to do that. And so uh, with that working group that was set up, they went through a process of, and, and reflect very much on, on Anna's experiences of that community process of collecting up uh, community workshops, uh, community recommendations. Uh, there's also an, a, a report from the National Academies, which was co-led by Shell, uh, looking at, at some of the policies. Um, and these actually came together at a very high level and ambitious open science strategy called the Strategy for Data Management and Computing, um, which came out in, at the end of 2019. And so they put this, this strategy together for, for 2019 to 2014, or 2019 to 2024, uh, released it at the end of 2019. Um, and you know, one of the, the, the main parts of the, the strategy was to, to hire a group, which would actually be really looking at this. And this uh, uh, led to the formation of the Chief Science Data Office, which is uh, I'm part of. But just to mention um, that this all kicked off uh, with, uh, at the same time, of course, that the COVID pandemic uh, really started as well. Um, and, you know, I think uh, one thing that we don't often, you know, think about institutional change and dimension is also about how the external factors also can influence and come together at the same time. Uh, so much of what, um, you know, I, I even actually think about this panel right now. Um, I'm not sure how likely we would be doing this in a, a pre-COVID world. Um, and, you know, hopefully with all the, the horrible things that, that have happened during the pandemic, we can hopefully take some of the, 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 the silver linings uh, and the, some positive aspects of it that I think it really highlighted the need for open science. Um, at the same time, uh, NASA was introducing inclusion as one of its core values. Um, you know, the unfortunately, the George Floyd murders also happened, um, you know, shortly in around that time as well, uh, which also really highlighted that aspect of having inclusion uh, and the importance of that. Um, you know, and so that, you know, not only is there these uh, internal efforts, but there's also sometimes these external efforts um, or, or external events uh, that are happening that also really reflect on, on what we're doing. Um, and so with this, we, we did end up setting up the Open Source Science Initiative. I think Steve was saying that he was talking about the Open Source Science Initiative, which has been set up within the Chief Science Data Office at NASA. The Open Source Science Initiative is a $30 million initiative this year increasing to $50 million pending appropriations in the coming years. And this, this is really a game changer. Steve. Yeah, and so one of the things to come out of that is a transform to open science effort. And as kind of mentioned, I think by others, um, you know, and, and in the chat is that open science is a cultural change. And, and that part of uh, uh, helping the community to adopt open science is our transform to open science effort. And so 
the institutional changes are hitting on a lot of different aspects. And, and actually, uh, as kind of mentioned previously, really depending upon the community and these other efforts as other groups uh, make steps forward as well to, to all of us to, to, uh, to, to uh, uh, travel together uh, along this open science journey. Well, can you tell us a couple of sentences about the journey since the launch of DOP and your work? Yeah, so uh, I uh, wrote up a one pager, uh, which apparently was compelling enough. I sent it to the chief science data officer at NASA, who was with Steve, really laying the groundwork for the open source science initiative and tops filled into that sort of gap, like filled in the cultural change part of it. And so we got immediate support from NASA. And I think one key lesson that I've learned trying to work with federal agencies uh, over many years is that it is very hard to do anything without a budget because you end up being volunteer and not having time. And I think that's been one of the really great successes as uh, sometimes trivial as it sounds, just simply having funding and having people to work on this, having Steve full-time and myself full-time. So with Steve working on the Open Source Science Initiative, really laying the groundwork and the policy, TOPS came in to really try and build the community and ensure that we had that two-way dialogue so that we were able to hear what people were saying as well as try to communicate more about open science. And I came to Steve with this idea for a year of open science across NASA. Uh, it was originally 2022 and he sort of laughed at me and said, that's in four months now. And uh, so we changed it to 2023. And then uh, we went to the White House and got the White House involved. And now there's 14 federal agencies representing $90 billion in science funding. And I think the most important thing to also notice about that is that we're at a point where there is a cultural shift happening. There's the momentum happening, the groundwork that all of the people here and probably many of the people on the call, all of the work that the community has been doing over the past two decades has gotten us to a point where I think this radical transformation, this acceleration of adoption of open science is gathering momentum and really possible. It's really exciting to see all of these community efforts coming together. And um, I really appreciate you, all, you actually bringing them in as well in, in the work that you're doing. Anna, drawing from your work in UNESCO Open Science, how do you think these action-oriented focused efforts drive the conversation forward, impacting other actors who may not already be involved in this conversation? Um, but again, as as Shel, as Shel was saying, th there is a momentum and there is a lot of things that are uh, that are happening and moving open science movement uh, forward. Uh, at the same time, as we move forward, we also start seeing what the challenges are. So I think the next step is going to be be very open about what the challenges are. What are some of these unintended consequences of moving to open science practices? The APCs models are one can say one of those. And then what are the ways and means to address them? So I think that's kind of the what, what is going to be very important moving forward is to be clear about the challenges, the risks, and how do we address them? What I see very interesting from our point of view and where I sit in the science technology innovation policies section of UNESCO is that there is a movement towards creation of national policies, strategic plans, roadmaps, uh, name different names, but the same idea is to create some kind of a framework within which open science will function in, on a national level. And I think that, and even on institutional level, we have more and more institutions that are finally having their open um, science policies, or maybe they can be open access, open data, then trying to find some kind of framework that would accommodate all of them. So I think that's a very positive step forward and through open science policies, 
or strategies or roadmaps or action plans, you actually do include also those actors who normally would not kind of naturally be um, uh, be included in this process. So we've been working with several countries in, in Africa. I mean, um, Knox can tell you more about the South African policy, which is almost there or has already been adopted. I, I haven't followed the last steps, but it, it's a very good policy as well. Uh, many other countries who are embarking in that. And we also see, for example, the countries who are actually developing their STI policies for the first time, including chapters on open science, which is also very, very interesting. That's exactly the idea. And that is that open science really is part of, of science. It's not you have science and you have open science. You have science that is open and, and that should be something uh, to, to do in the future. It should, you know, not even have open in front of it. It should just be, be science. And we've seen that in different kind. The last one was Sierra Leone that just they launched their science policy and it has elements of open science all around it. So, so yes, for me, what I see is development of these policies um, really as an important step forward um, to building this community of open science and uh, doing this transformation and cultural shift towards um, open science. And, and just to let you know, I, I was supposed to leave at 4.15, but my meeting has been postponed. So I can stay with you until the end of the, the discussions uh, with great pleasure, yeah. So don't oh, have to fantastic. rush because of me. It's like, oh, I'm going to rush <laughs> I know. Now. <laughs> oh, no, no but that, what, what you just said is a really, really a great way to, to tie all of these we are talking about, right? Like that we are building on years and years of movement and there is years and years of movement still to uh, go to. There's so much accumulated expertise among the speakers here in the call, but also the, the folks who have joined us to listen in, all of them are brilliant leaders that I recognize by name. So thank you all for joining and listening to us. I'd especially like to share an insight from some of the preparatory discussion we were having that institutional leadership support and infrastructure is absolutely essential, of course, but they are only effective when communities are included, skilled and empowered to utilize them in the ways that is useful for them with the appropriate credit and incentives for their participation in the implementation of open science. All the initiatives we have learned about today have been working for years before they got to where they are. Noak said in her talk that in 10 years, open science movement may not look like what, they, what, what we think it should look like. And Steve also said that change takes a long time and then it happens all at once. So maybe we are at that stage. So now to close this very, very enriching discussion, I'd like to ask each of our speakers to share their 30 seconds closing remark on what advice you would have for institutions and communities who have been building up skills and capacity to enable implementation of open science. I'll start with Nox. Yeah, I just have two things is, is one, we just have to start somewhere. It's not perfect because the current system is even worse. So we have to start and do something and, and we perfect it during uh, the journey too. We can have all the infrastructure, all the, everything, the computers, the policies, the frameworks. If we do not convince the doer, we must forget it. So this is the most important thing. And for me, now when I come to this open science kind of things, I think we need to try and now move away for us as a community of practice to go into communities of practice and we become ambassadors where these people are not in this community start hearing about, about open science. And I, I think now that's where we actually try to need to move away because we are here, we are the coalition of the willing or, or of agreement. We need to then go to, to the other communities and, and that's my tip, thank you. Thank you so much, Nox. Anna? Um, yeah, I agree with Knox. I mean, it, it has to start somewhere. So it's, it's, it is good to start. But the other point is also that particularly at the institutional level, I think uh, valuing open science practices is very important. So coming up with ideas of what other types of incentives and values we have for how we do science is very important because it, it really will uh, have a lot of impact, particularly on young scientists. And those are the ones that we wanna 
push towards open science as much as possible. But if we don't have value systems in place, an evaluation system in place that will incentivize them to move towards open science practices, it will be very difficult, particularly for them, to really um, commit to open science. Brilliant. Alex? Um, sorry, I wasn't aware it was me. Um, yeah, so uh, I would say listen, uh, listen to what uh, their needs are and the differences, the different, uh, the asymmetries, they are important and they are um, also valuable to create the diversity and, and, and also uh, respect the different cultures and, and, and uh, different disciplines. So have dialogues, uh, it's very important. Uh, we, you also learn a lot from that. Um, and work on raise awareness uh, by showing the benefits of open science, the best practices, uh, success cases. Uh, those are things that uh, really help to, uh, to kind of uh, dismissify the, some of the more, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, scary of the unknown uh, uh, of what open science might represent to some communities. So showing the benefits and success cases, I think it's very important. Thank you, Alex. Steve? Yeah, and I love that Alex mentioned listen, because that was, uh, I think, you know, uh, I think that's, you know, a big part of my job as at the Institute and being a, a, a leader as, as one of the big institutes is to listen to those who are in different communities and, and definitely a diverse group of different communities um, to, to learn about, you know, what they need and also what they're doing. Um, and then to, to identify, you know, and, and for those who are leading in open science um, to, to elevate, uh, support and celebrate uh, what they're doing. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Well, I think you stole all my thunder, Alex and Steve. Uh, it's a hard act to follow up with everyone's providing such inspirational comments, but I wanna to add to this a little bit, which is as we've been going out into the community and working with especially early career people, uh, I think that the early career people and the diverse voices and perspectives that they're bringing are ready for open science. And I encourage everyone to demand change at this point. I think that you can see that institutions are changing. We have your backs. And I think that it's really important to recognize that we want, I want this change and uh, we're here to listen and support you. So hold us accountable. Tell us what we're doing right. Tell us what we're doing wrong engage with us because we want to support you and your community as we move everyone towards open science and a more equitable future. Thank you. So today I was a facilitator. I, of course, uh, would love to hear a lot more from our speakers and I haven't taken a lot of time to share what we are doing at the touring. So I'll just take 10 seconds to talk about um, some of the work that we are doing at, in the Turing Institute. The Turing Way is hosted within a program called Tools, Practices, and Systems, which should have originally be called Open Infrastructure, but we are going with Tools, Practices, and System as the actionable things that we are doing. It's led by Kirsty Whitaker, who's also the lead of the Turing Way. And what I, will, I would like to take away and, and ask our audience to also take away is that some of the work we are doing is about building the glue work, the different infrastructure role that people play in order to implement open science, the tools, practices, and system hosts the community managers team that I mentioned in my opening. But there are other teams like research application management, there is uh, research ethics, there is also citizen science, and a lot of different parts that we are trying to work within the Turing Institute, but also share that knowledge via the Turing way, uh, build some more implementation knowledge that we understand and ex experiment at the Turing Institute. But also share in a more transferable way how we can reproduce that in the rest of the world. So with that, I'd like to thank all our speakers for sharing what they shared with us uh, and just invite you all to, to do a round of applause, your virtual emoji, it shows some love um, and I'll pass it to Anne to close us off. 
Thank you all uh, for such a wonderful session. So many thoughts um, and reflections to take into, uh, not only into the coming weeks and months, but in the next five, 10 years, 20 years, much longer as open science becomes a more institutionalized process. We really wanna get, thank you all, give a round of applause to all of you for giving us your time uh, on this Friday morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you're calling in from. I am going to turn off the recording here. Um, and as we said at the beginning of the call, um, we'll leave open this space for the next 10 minutes or so uh, for any questions you might have.